I'm Adam Grant. I'm here with Caddy Kay, co-author of The Confidence Code. Welcome, Caddy. Thank you, Adam. So what drove you to write this book? <laughs> you know, we wrote another book, six, as so often happens. You write one book and you end up writing another book. So we wrote a book about six years ago on the value of women in the workforce. And for that book, we interviewed a lot of senior women in business, in the military, in politics. And we were struck by phrases that they would use, phrases like, I'm just lucky to have got where I've got to, or I was in the right place at the right time, or, you know, I think I'm not quite ready for that promotion yet. And it occurred to us that we never heard men say things like this and what was going what? on. What? How could this be? What is it? You all think you deserve that next promotion immediately. And uh, it just struck us that something was happening with women in the professional space that was not happening in their home lives. When you ask them about their kids or their friends, they think they're great. You know, they're, they're totally confident of their ability to make friendships or be great mothers or supportive wives, but get them into the professional space. And we wondered if it was just anecdotal or if there was actually data behind this. And what led you to the initial idea that it was a confidence gap as opposed to humility, let's say? Because they were whole, it wasn't just words. They weren't saying one thing and doing another. They genuinely believed they weren't good enough. And when you start looking into all of the data, Wharton's done some of it. Uh, Columbia Business School has done run numbers on men overestimate their abilities by some 30%. Women routinely underestimate their abilities. You talk to all the psychologists who are working in business schools who will put men and women in front of scientific reasoning quests quizzes, the women will routinely think they've done less well than they've done, the men will think they've done better than they've done. In reality, they've done about the same. So it's that women's perception of their ability skews below their actual ability. It's not that they're just saying, I'm not very good, but actually thinking they're really good. They don't believe they are as good as they are. And that's why, that's what the confidence gap is. Women don't believe they are as good as they are. And you point out that it's not just women, but that as a BBC journalist, you'd actually experience this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm you know, riddled with this and have been for the last 30 years of my career. I, my favorite was I spent years in America saying that the only reason I've been successful in America is because I speak the way I do. I mean, it can't possibly be my talents, right? Or my ability or my hard work. And that is preposterous. It had to be some external factor. And in my case, it was the fact that I speak with a British accent, which makes people think I'm smarter than I am. And I actually believed this, Adam. I mean, for years, I believed this. Claire will tell you, my co-author, she's been banging on about this one for years. And we all find Claire's thing that she had was that she only became Moscow's, CNN's Moscow correspondent because she happened to be in the right place. And that is very common for women. And what did you do when you noticed that there were people with British accents here who weren't successful? Because <laughs> well, that, would, that, would, that, would, that would violate <laughs> the theory at some level. You always find some reason they must have some problem. Hmm. <laughs> okay, so um, so you identify the gap. No right? one's the, ever asked me that before. <laughs> Good. Well, the 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 confidence gap, um, you know, a lot of data behind it, right? right? Um, so what what do we do about it? Where does it come from, and and how do we start to to well, solve I mean, the problem? I'm, it led us to then on this rather uh, tangential uh, quest to find out what confidence is. We thought that if we were going to try and grow confidence, we were better off if we knew what we were dealing with. So we, would, we interviewed dozens of neurologists and psychologists for the book, and we would always start off with this simple question, can you define confidence for us? And inevitably, we'd be met by a pause. Hmm, well, it's complicated. And we went into this with a couple of misconceptions. First of all, we thought that confidence was the same as self-esteem, a general feeling that you're a valuable person. I have high self-esteem. I think I'm a valuable person. The universe is a friendly place. Um, it's an almost sort of moral, emotional quality that is pervasive to who you are as a human being. We, all, we were wrong. Confidence is not the same as self-esteem. We also thought, and this was wrong too, the confidence is a manner, a mannerism. It's a bravado, a sense of swagger. It's that thing of dominating meetings or speaking loudest and longest. We were wrong as well. Confidence is nothing to do with a manner. It's to do with a belief that you can succeed at something. So we'd ask all these neurologists and psychologists, what is confidence? And finally, it was Richard Petty, who's a psychologist at Ohio State, who said to us, 
But he thought the best definition of confidence was this. Confidence is the stuff that turns thoughts into action, which is beautifully simple. And the great thing about that idea is that not only does it turn thoughts into action, I want to introduce myself to that interesting looking person at a party, but I feel nervous about doing so. Confidence gets you across the room to shake somebody's hand and introduce yourself. When you do it, when you take the action, you grow your confidence. So it's a wonderfully virtuous circle. It's about confidence, it's about action. Even when you take the action ineffectively though, so you make the introduction, yeah. it's a complete right. disaster, what happens yes. then? Even if you fail, even if you meet, a, you have to meet hurdles when you try something new. It's inevitable, right? You're always going to meet hurdles. You introduce yourself to that person, they brush you off. Think to yourself, what's the worst that's happened? Did the sky fall on your head? Did the earth open up and swallow you whole because that person brushed you off? No, you're still standing. You're still there. And in a sense, even if you fail, you've learned that you can take a risk, try something hard. Even if you fail, you're still there. Now, if you keep doing that, eventually you'll succeed. If you introduce yourself to the next person, the chances are pretty slim that they're going to brush you off as well. You've learned that you can do something and that your world doesn't fall apart because you try something that's outside your comfort zone. I read the news every night to millions of people around the world. It doesn't test my confidence. Working at Wharton Business School would terrify me. I'm absolutely convinced I'd be useless at doing what you do. The only way I would ever find out would be to try. That's how you build confidence. You take something that is challenging to you, that seems difficult, that is new and hard and outside your comfort zone, a small thing or a big thing, and you keep going and you overcome hurdles, and you succeed to some degree. And that's how you build confidence. What I like about this a lot is it's an interesting counterpoint to the self-esteem movement, yeah. right? Which, which we all know from mountains of evidence did almost no good and a lot of harm. Right. Um, and this is different, right? This isn't about looking in the mirror and saying, I'm really great. It's actually right. about increasing your ability to, as you said, convert thoughts into action. Right. So do you have any other favorite strategies for boosting confidence then? <laughs> okay, so here's another reason that there's a confidence gap. One of the reasons that there's a confidence gap between men and women, women find action often harder than men because we are more risk averse, because we're, the fear of failure is enormous for us. Seems to be bigger than it is for men. The other thing that women do is we think a lot. We run around inside our own heads. I sent Adam that email. He didn't get back to me after half an hour. Maybe he's mad at me. I did. Maybe actually. the whole of Wharton is mad at me. Maybe everyone at Penn is mad at me because I didn't get back to them. That's the way women work. We extrapolate. We take one small thing, a, a small slight, a small criticism, a small thing we've done wrong, and it holds us back from acting and trying hard things because we're running around in our own heads. And one of the things we think about in the confidence code is you have to think less. You actually have to draw a line under those thoughts. Women dwell on the things they've done wrong. It's what happens in review processes. Uh, it's what happens in negotiations with our bosses. And what happens when we're, there's one piece of work we didn't manage to hand in on time that day, even though we've done five other good pieces of work, we'll remember the one piece of work we didn't do so well. We need to find a way to draw a red line under that. It's interesting, though, because everything you say, to me, it sounds like a list of desirable attributes. And For everybody. <laughs> yeah, and so is, isn't, isn't a possible solution here just to get men down to the level of reasonable confidence? Uh, you know, we asked about that, and, 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 so, and counterpoint is we're asked, well, aren't we, try, aren't we at risk of pushing women into overconfidence? I don't think we're at any risk of pushing women into overconfidence. I see no evidence that we're going to suddenly become... Um, you know, Lehman Brothers, Redux, all of us. I just don't think that's going to happen. Ideally, everyone needs a little bit of overconfidence. I and mean, it's interesting that psychologists disagree about most things. But the one thing they actually do agree about is that a little bit of overconfidence is better than a little bit of underconfidence. Men probably have too much and it might be better for all of us if some of it came down, particularly if you're thinking of a cultural environment in the office space, right? If you're thinking of meeting environments or uh, employee-employer relations, that is to some extent a mannerism. But I think the priority is to get women over this hump of underconfidence because that's what's stopping them from 
part of what's stopping them from taking action and getting to the next level. Mm -hmm. So you've talked a little bit about stretching outside of comfort zones. Um, if you were going to create sort of your wish list of a couple <laughs> of, of steps that women and also men lacking confidence ought to take, what else would go on that list? Be prepared to fail. Get over the fear of failure. The, the sort of techie buzz phrase, fail fast, is a great one for women. Women hold themselves to a very high standard. We know this. Women are 25% more prone to perfectionism than men are. We're perfectionists at work. We're perfectionists as wives. We're perfectionists as mothers. We're perfectionists in the yoga studio. You name it, we want to be perfect at it. If you're going to try and be perfect, you're never going to get there. It's an impossible standard, right? No one is ever going to be perfect. But this pursuit of perfection is something that holds us back from taking risks because it makes us very scared of failing. And I think what, one of the first things that people who are underconfident need to do is give up trying to be perfect. It'll be the single biggest thing that they can do to help them take risks and be prepared to fail. In closing, is there a point that you feel has been misunderstood or oversimplified that you want to set the record okay, straight on? So, yes. One is the idea, some people have said to us, well, aren't we just trying to make women like men? And we wrestled with this when we were writing the book. Basically, do you have to be a jerk to be confident? Because I think a lot of women look around at them and they see a, a very male me model of confidence in the professional space that frankly is unappealing and inaccessible to us because it's downright foreign. And it was Christine Lagarde, uh, the head of the IMF, who was, who was really helpful to us in explaining this. She said it's essential for women to be authentic. Don't give up the very qualities that make you valuable, an ability to listen, ability to build consensus, a high EQ that's good at reading a room, warmth. Warmth is an amazing quality to have. It's a very powerful quality. Don't give up all of that. In the pursuit of a mannerism, bravado and swagger, which doesn't really suit you, and when you try it, doesn't work for you anyway. So you want to be confident in that you want your voice to be heard. You don't want to apologize. You don't, as Sheryl Sandberg says, want to lean back. But you want to do it in a way that is authentic to who you are as a woman. And that's critical, I think, for people. We're not asking people to become somebody different. We're just asking them to bring their perception of their abilities in line with their abilities. And when you're there, you're in the sweet spot. Great. Thank you, Caddy. Thank you.